Good morning, good morning. Welcome. Welcome. You hear me? Yes, okay. All right, well, let's get started. Um, thank you for coming to our Medical Education Grand Rounds. Um, we had the pleasure of having Dr. Anthony Chang. Um, Dr. Chang is the Chief Intelligence and Innovation Officer and Medical Director of the Heart Failure Program at the Children's Hospital of Orange County. Additionally, Dr. Chang is the founder and medical director of the Sharon Disney Lund Medical Intelligence and Innovation Institute at the Children's Hospital of Orange County. Dr. Chang received his MD degree from Georgetown University School of Medicine. He then went on to complete his pediatric residency at Children's Hospital National Medical Center and furthermore uh, finished his pediatric cardiology fellowship at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Dr. Chang has also completed an MBA in healthcare administration, an MPH in healthcare policy, and a master's of science in biomedical data science with a sub-area focus in artificial intelligence. He is a computer scientist in residence and a member of the Dean's Scientific Council at Chapman University. As the medical director of the Medical Intelligence and Innovation Institute, known as MI3, Dr. Chang oversees the Institute's mission to implement data science and artificial intelligence, or AI, in medicine. MI3 is the first institute of its kind in a hospital. The new institute is concomitantly dedicated to facilitate innovation in children and healthcare all over the world. He is the organizing chair of the, uh, for the Biennial Pediatric 2040 Emerging Trends and Future Innovations Meeting, as well as the founder and director of the Medical Intelligence Innovation Summer Internship Program, which mentors close to 100 young physicians-to-be every summer. Dr. Chang's main focus in the area of AI is building a clinician-computer scientist interface to enhance all aspects of data science and artificial intelligence in health and medicine. He currently lectures widely on big data and AI in medicine. He has published review papers on big data and predictive ana analytics, as well as machine learning and AI in medicine. He is on the editorial board of the Journal of Medical Artificial Intelligence, and he currently uh, is completing a book project titled Intelligence-Based Medicine, Principles and Applications of Data Science, Artificial Intelligence, and Human Cognition in Medi Clinical Medicine and Healthcare. It's a long title. <laughs> he, uh, uh, as his uh, role uh, as a pediatric cardiologist, Dr. Chang has also been named a physician of excellence by the Orange County Medical Association and a top cardiologist and top doctor for many years, as well as one of the nation's top innovators in healthcare. He is known for several innovations in pediatric cardiac care, including introducing the cardiac drug milrinone and co-designing with Dr. Michael DeBakey an axial type ventricular assist device in children. He is a concomitant member, a uh, committee member of the National Institute of Health Pediatric Grant Review Committee. He is the editor of several textbooks in pediatric cardiology, including Pediatric Cardiac Intensive Care, Heart Failure in Children and Young Adults, and Pediatric Cardiology Board Review. Uh, finally, uh, Dr. Chang is the founder of the Pediatric Cardiac Intensive Care Society. He also founded the Asian Pacific Pediatric Cardiac Society, which unites pediatric cardiologists and cardiac surgeons from 24 Asian countries. Today, Dr. Chang will, pre will be presenting his talk titled, Artificial Intelligence in Medical Education, Robots, Watson, Machine Learning, or Hype. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Chang to the podium. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you, Nat, for the invitation, and thank you, Rose, for the kind introduction. The short version of that introduction is just I'm a very nerdy doctor, that's all. So um, it's been really fascinating to see the evolution and development of artificial intelligence. So thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. Um, and it's also kind of a nice homecoming for me because as I came in late from the airport last night, and I realized that uh, it's been almost 30 years since I did my fellowship here, so it's nice to see Children's Hospital of Philadelphia now becoming a, a medical city, essentially. But I have to say, as a data scientist this morning, uh, it's interesting that there's this big void on this side of the room, so uh, 
it's not uh, evenly distributed as a, as a, uh, as a room. So um, you're seeing a lot of news about artificial intelligence these days, and this is just um, came out last week. So a robot hand now can do Rubik's Cube in less than four minutes. Now, this is, may not impress you as much, but the non-robotic hand version solving Rubik's Cube is now 0.3 seconds. So a machine can solve Rubik's Cube in 0.3 seconds. So those of you who are surgeons, don't worry, you're not going to lose your jobs, and I'll explain why. Okay. So I just want to get a feel from the audience. It's, um, it's been a few months since I've been to the Northeast giving a talk, especially in Philadelphia. Wanted to see by sh the old-fashioned show of hands how many people would adopt this kind of artificial intelligence. All right, so it's, it's interesting, different parts of the country, different parts of the world in terms of adoption. So how many people, raise your hand if you're willing to sit um, behind an autonomous driven vehicle uh, and not touching the steering wheel or the brake. You're willing to sit in there with a destination. Okay, that's pretty good, that's pretty good, two thirds. How about this scenario, autonomous flying vehicle which is already in existence. No pilot, no human pilot. Notice a lot of the younger hands went up, okay. <laughs> How about a straightforward appendectomy with no human surgeon? There are a couple of hands up there. <laughs> okay, so um, it's interesting because just two years ago, two or three years ago, um, only a few hands would go up for the very first scenario. So I call this automation creep or AI creep. So slowly but surely, more and more of the population is willing to accept the automation or the AI-related um, phenomenon. So just a few words about myself. Um, I'm a practicing pediatric cardiologist. And about 10 years ago, um, I've always taught or liked biostat biostatistics and realized that data science had taken a whole new dimension. Went back to school, uh, fortunate enough to um, go to Stanford and finish the program in biomedical data science and AI, and have really one of the best jobs in the world, I think. Um, I get to go around and talk to, talk to people about artificial intelligence and try to find ways to deploy AI in clinical medicine. And um, this is a necessary selfie for um, going to visit um, Bletchley Park, where Alan Turing uh, did most of his work. And you may be familiar with um, Alan Turing from the movie The Imitation Game. So this was actually the typewriter that he did most of his work uh, without a computer back then. So, um, and one of the things I get to do is talk to big organizations like Google, who um, uh, the organization has deep mind uh, in London to work on healthcare projects. So where are we in terms of um, medical education since that's uh, a theme for us this morning? So I think if we look at evidence-based medicine, uh, it's served us pretty well for the last few decades, but I think the trajectory is relatively um, flat now, given the amount of information and data that we have to contend with. So in order for us to practice um, the future of medicine, which is kind of both precision medicine on the individual side, or personalized medicine, and then population health, that's a tremendous demand on the data and information that we're going to need to have. And there's this huge gap. So I think the only way we can reach um, that kind of expectation is to have what I call intelligence-based medicine, or medicine that's more based on data science as well as artificial intelligence. Specifically, if we look at medical education, I think conventional, traditional medical education has also, I think, plateaued in terms of being able to deliver the knowledge and information that we need to have for the future clinician. So the 21st century physician will have this increasingly uh, large knowledge and skills gap which has to be made up with a totally different paradigm of education that will have to include the emerging technologies like artificial intelligence um, and augmented and um, virtual reality. 
So uh, the probably the best definition of artificial intelligence was the first one by Marvin Minsky. He and John McCarthy um, gathered about 50 computer scientists and mathematicians uh, in 1956 at Dartmouth to launch the whole field of artificial intelligence. And he said that it's the science of making machines do things that will require intelligence if done by, I'm going to change the word here, if done by humans. And this is the public perception of artificial intelligence. It's a menacing robot. And unfortunately, um, you still see magazine covers with the menacing robot. And, and I always say it's not about the robot. So, but this cartoon is interesting. It says, you're not being replaced by a robot, but you're being replaced by someone who understands robots. Um, for the first time, I'm seeing um, advertisements for um, clinicians with a background in data science or artificial intelligence, especially in radiology and cardiology. So I think this cartoon used to draw some um, jokes, uh, draw some um, laughs, but it's kind of becoming reality. So maybe the first takeaway is that it's really not only about robots, it's about so many other things as well. And on one slide, this is the relationship of some of the things that you've heard about uh, with deep learning and machine learning. So deep learning is a sophisticated machine learning that's under the umbrella of artificial intelligence, which usually sits in the computer science department. Um, data science is a relatively new branch that deals with analytics and data mining, and that's converging with artificial intelligence as well. So this is um, artificial intelligence on one slide. <clears throat> so we have Robotics and autonomous systems, you know about those um, aspects of our AI from drones. Cognitive computing, which is symbolized by IBM Watson. And natural language processing, uh, you know this um, from seeing chatbots as well as virtual assistants now. So this is the human-like aspects of artificial intelligence. And then there are uh, aspects of artificial intelligence that's more machine-focused. And that's classical machine learning, which is basically just think about it as sort of very uh, sophisticated statistics. And that's um, supervised and unsupervised learning. A lot of the excitement now is in the area of deep learning because of the promise of deep learning to really tackle the enigmas in medicine. And particularly convolutional neural network, or CNN, in interpreting medical images. Recurring neural network, or RNN, is focused on time series data, like you see in the ICU. And then most of the excitement, particularly in the next decade, is going to be on the lower left, lower left corner with reinforcement learning, which is how human clinicians actually practice medicine, being rewarded for a good outcome. So that's going to be a game changer, I think, in uh, medicine in general. So right now, artificial intelligence is um, there's a, a big orchestra of instruments, but it kind of sounds like this right now. Okay, it's sort of, um, by the way, that's the Pacific Symphony warming up. Um, it's sort of cacophonous right now, not a whole lot of makes sense, but it's going to take all of us to get involved, learn about artificial intelligence to really make sense out of all the instruments uh, particularly in practice of medicine. So as you know, we're just starting in this area in clinical medicine. So one of the most important things to understand about artificial intelligence is that it really depends on a good foundational layer of data and information, which is often lacking in medicine. So 80 to 90% of um, biomedical data is unstructured. So it's very difficult for machines to work with and also oftentimes inaccurate and incomplete. So I sort of uh, draw the analogy between artificial intelligence and medicine as sort of having a special guest over for dinner. Um, you need to get your house in order before you can actually enjoy the dividends from artificial intelligence. So another takeaway is the artificial intelligence really needs an excellent foundation of data information, which um, really is lacking in medicine right now. So if you don't know how to program, but you still want to be involved in making sure artificial intelligence has a role in clinical medicine in the future, 
I think one of the best ways you can contribute is to work on data and information to make it easier for uh, those of us who have an interest in, in artificial intelligence to really um, benefit from the good data and information layers. So where are we in artificial intelligence now? The current state is here. So we're just starting to see narrow tasks being taken on by artificial intelligence and superseding human performance. Um, in about probably 10 20 to 25 years, we'll start seeing computers and machine learning and artificial intelligence start really mimicking the way that clinicians think. So it's going to happen in our lifetime, and it's going to, as someone famously said, the future it doesn't just arrive, you have to actually work for it. So the more clinicians, particularly the younger generation clinicians, the more clinicians get involved, the more likely we're going to get there um, faster. So why artificial intelligence now? It's kind of come and gone the last few decades. Well, three things converged that really makes it, I think, um, uh, very, very real this time. One is the sophistication of algorithms, especially starting around 2010, 2011, with a lot of good work coming out of Toronto. Um, the second element has been cloud com the development of cloud computing that enables a lot of data to be stored and manipulated. And the third element has been the, thanks to our game playing um, population, the demand for faster and faster computer chips. This is the GPU that's really um, changed the perspective of how fast we can do computational science. And lastly, of course, the mounting amount of um, data in biomedicine. So this all kind of converged to make artificial intelligence, I think, one of the most exciting developments in clinical medicine in the last few decades. I think there's some confusion about the different types of artificial intelligence, and unfortunately, they all start with the letter A. So um, if you can bear with me, assisted AI is, think about the iRoomba vacuum cleaner um, going around your house. It's programmed, it does what it does. It doesn't need to interact with humans to do its job. And in healthcare, I listed there a couple of examples. Um, one example is the robot that does blood work at Copenhagen Hospital. Um, everything just kind of is done automatically, including analyzing the blood, but also inputting the data into the medical records. What's been getting a lot of discussion is augmented type of artificial intelligence, and that's where the humans and the machines really collaborate a great deal. So there's a partnership to achieve a specific task. Um, you see a lot of excitement about this in analytics. For instance, um, last week, if you read the Wall Street Journal, you would have learned that for the first time, more um, trades in the stock market in the US is being done now by machines rather than humans. So the lines have crossed between machines and humans. Uh, obviously, humans still need to stay involved because what the machines don't have is common sense. So um, it's, it, it really takes the partnership. And that's one of the recurrent themes that you hear about is that there really needs to be a partnership between humans and machines for AI to really be um, the most effective. So the healthcare example is IBM Watson, uh, which I know has had some negative publicity, but I think it's also a potential game changer in the future as well. Now, the kind of AI that makes some people nervous is the autonomous kind of AI, and that's where the machines are on it, performing a task on its own, learning to be better without uh, much human intervention. And if you think that you're going to be worried when that comes, um, you can start worrying about it now because it's already here. Um, there is a software called IDXDR, which is autonomously interpreting fundus photographs for diabetic uh, retinopathy. So it doesn't need human ophthalmologists to be uh, involved in interpreting those images, and it's actually uh, superseding the performance of even groups of board-certified ophthalmologists. So think about the impact for global health, where this is a huge problem. So on one slide, this shows you 
the different parts of the brain, the clinician's brain, that the computers can actually um, help. Um, image recognition is already being done routinely at a few places with uh, artificial intelligence and deep learning. Uh, machine learning is also increasingly being used at different pro in different programs, clinical programs for um, making clinical decisions. And natural language processing, I think, is going to have a huge role in the next decade. And that's where the uh, machines and humans uh, learn to communicate with one another, uh, both written and spoken language. And there's a lot of discussion about IBM Watson and what that is, and often get, people get confused between IBM Watson and artificial intelligence. And IBM Watson is simply a small portfolio of artificial intelligence tools. So since we had the orchestra analogy earlier, just think about IBM Watson as a small string ensemble. Uh, it's not the whole package, but it's part of the AI um, toolkit. So artificial, uh, IBM Watson essentially cognitive computing, which is how computers think at, like a human being, with some machine learning and natural language processing. So if you're curious, that's what IBM Watson looks like underneath. Essentially a very, very powerful search algorithm with some of the tools I've mentioned. Uh, I've said a few words about natural language processing, and this is, I think, one of the biggest yields that we're going to see in medicine once we understand how to deploy. Um, this is the ability for computers to understand what we're writing and what we're um, speaking. And um, the, this area has really, really uh, made a lot of progress, particularly the last couple of years. And that's going to be critical because think about your notes that you've written on, on the wards and uh, when you're in class. It's very unstructured. It's a very human way of expressing thoughts. And it is very difficult for the machines to understand exactly what you mean by what you wrote or what you're saying. So I think that's going to play a huge role in really transforming how we store information and knowledge. And right now, this field has progressed to natural language understanding, or NLU, and even natural language generation. Um, you probably heard about computers now writing articles. Some that actually the sports articles you're reading are actually being written by machines. You may just not know it. Um, because it's the same kind of formula, and the machines are good at taking scores and making a story out of those scores. So in essence, for AI and healthcare, we're sort of at the Wright Brothers stage, early stage of deploying artificial intelligence in medicine. But I think in a couple of decades, <clears throat> two or three decades, we'll be venturing out to space at a faster velocity and a greater height than any bird has ever flown. So a few areas of, um, um, I think, real dividends already for artificial intelligence and medicine. One is uh, decision support and hospital monitoring. If you think about how we've looked at hospital monitoring, it's always been unidirectional. It's displaying data, but we're really not doing much with that data other than reacting to uh, certain uh, scenarios. And the exciting thing about AI and decision support is that we can actually be very proactive rather than reactive. So this is something that we've deployed at our hospital. It's a special real-time analytic platform that will um, alert the clinician if there is an unfavorable trend looking at the hemodynamic and biochemical profile. So this is essentially an early warning system for clinicians, particularly in a busy ICU setting. Another big area that's got garnered a lot of attention and interest um, is medical imaging and biomedical diagnostics. I'm a cardiologist, so I see a lot of um, MRIs and echocardiograms as well as EKGs. So these areas are being taken on by machine intelligence as well. So I mentioned convolutional neural network, CNN. I'll be talking to, I guess, the radiologist later today about CNNs. This is essentially, think of CNN as dozens to hundreds of filters that mimic how the visual cortex works in the human brain. So essentially, it's going to deconstruct any image and really gather information from previous examples, 
previous human labeled examples to teach the computer to read these images faster and better than humans can. So this is already being done for ophthalmology, cardiology, radiology, pathology, and dermatology. So in every subspecialty, uh, machine learning and deep learning now has been uh, able to perform at a higher level than even groups of that uh, subspecialty. And this is just a um, picture of some of my former uh, Stanford colleagues looking at x-rays now using AI-derived heat maps, which draws attention to um, areas that the computer considers abnormal um, for the radiologist to review. So um, even at 7 o'clock in the morning, you can probably figure out this is an alternating uh, matrix of blueberry muffins and chihuahuas. Um, <laughs> Now, it's very straightforward for humans to tell the difference, but believe it or not, this is sort of the Achilles heel for deep learning, but this will be solved, I think, in the next uh, year or so. So the computer right now, even the most sophisticated deep learning algorithms, still can't quite figure out the difference between um, chihuahuas and blueberry muffins, and you probably figured out, and the reason is that it's still not very good at the three-dimensional aspects of uh, images in general. It's very good at two-dimensional, but not quite good at three-dimensional. So because, it, because um, we are talking about um, how computers can learn like a child, so I tested my, back then Emma was four years old, I tested my, uh, yes, those of you who notice, I'm teaching her to play the game Go, which is uh, a very AI-centric game, but, um, She's smiling here, but she stopped smiling after the 14th move. Um, <laughs> but um, she was eight for eight um, without much prompting the difference between chihuahuas and blueberry muffins. Of course, she promptly wanted a chihuahua, so. <laughs> she got a blueberry muffin instead, so. Um, so the third area, I think it's gonna be hugely exciting for medicine, and we need, really, really need help in this area is precision medicine drug discovery. So we talk about precision medicine, but as you know, it's much easier to say those words than actually practice it. Um, and the reason is that humans are not very good at taking a lot of data and putting it all together, which is what computers are good at. So here you see a graphic showing you that the future of precision or personalized medicine is going to be taking layers of data and information and helping the clinician collate all that data into some actionable items. Um, and drug discovery is actually really fast becoming one of the most exciting areas when you look at artificial intelligence and clinical medicine. Think about all those clinical trials where the uh, clinician researcher is not sure what the result's gonna be. It's gonna be much more precise and targeted in the future because we're gonna be able to duplicate um, certain proteins and interactions with certain drugs before we launch them into clinical trials. So what you're going to start to see in clinic, uh, re clinical research is less and less dependence on randomized controlled trials and less and less dependence on, on clinical research just looking at a cohort of patients. We're going to be looking at thousands of patients all at once and um, collecting the data and analyzing it rather than sort of a top-down approach where uh, clinicians decide what the clinical strategy ought to be. So in the next decade or two, um, you're gonna be seeing bottom-up approach to clinical research much more than it's, has, than it's been in the past few decades. So medical imaging is very important. So maybe we can turn the volume down a little bit. Um, this is a three-dimensional rendering Perhaps you're already doing this in, in your medical education curriculum, but uh, in the future you're gonna be learning anatomy virtually with, um, and, uh, with different types of altered reality. This is myself and another cardiologist looking at the best way to deploy um, an atrial septal occluding device with an MRI that's 3D rendered from a patient so we can actually deploy that device before we 
do it for real in the cath lab. And you'll see more and more of this preoperative planning using images um, before we go and do the procedure. Um, I think in the future, there will be a lot more mentoring that's available for uh, younger surgeons in the operating room. Right now, once you graduate from a fellowship training, uh, oftentimes you're left to yourself to figure things out in the operating room. And uh, we're working on different ways of having video libraries and machine and deep learning so that that cumulative experience from thousands of surgeons will be available to um, help a young surgeon through, or a surgeon who's not used to doing a certain operation through the procedure. So this is actually, this hasn't happened. This is just sort of a fantasy from um, a surgeon friend and I looking at how uh, perhaps IBM Watson can be useful in the operating room. Blaise, I think it's best to make your incision right here. Here is the minor fissure. Here is the front of the major fissure. I would start right here and unroot the cyst. Follow this plane right here. The superior second arm root should be near there. So when I think about the exciting development of AI in surgery, I'm not really think of robots doing surgery, but having a lot of um, very, very useful um, collective or swarm intelligence to help any surgeon with certain operations. So there's a lot of um, bias in artificial intelligence in medicine because of the images that are available. Um, so if you look at um, dermatological pictures, uh, and this was, those of you who listened to National Public Radio, this was actually a big discussion uh, on the air yesterday about how textbook pictures of dermatologic lesions are actually um, mostly lesions on white skin, but rarely on um, color skin. Um, so different skin colors are not really usually depicted for the same pathology. So when you, um, if you think about machines and computers as an entity that you teach, then if you're feeding it information that's biased, then the machine's gonna be biased. So there's a lot of discussion about AI and bias in clinical medicine, because if we're feeding the machines only pictures of dermatological lesions uh, in people with white skin and not colored skin, then you're gonna have a very, very strong bias away from diagnosing um, dermatologic lesions in people of color. So that's something important to realize that it, it's only as smart as all the humans together in that subspecialty. So think of artificial intelligence in medicine and healthcare um, as a way of using a, a new resource to really uh, make an impact, uh, not just in clinical medicine, but also in administrative aspects of medicine. So in 2019, this country is spending $3 trillion and 20, 25% of those dollars are being spent in administering healthcare. So it's uh, um, full of inefficiencies and also um, repetitive work that can be really solved with artificial intelligence. So we're hoping that, because the argument is always, well, if we use artificial intelligence in a hospital, it's going to cost money because we may have to have a higher a higher data science team, but the counter argument is there's so much inefficiency and duplication of work in the hospital that you actually end up saving money by removing uh, a lot of the unnecessary work. For the clinician then in the future, think about artificial intelligence as wearing a different lens, looking at a aspects of your clinical work and allowing that resource to really make a difference in the way you practice medicine. So when I graduated from the Stanford program, my program director said, so after four years of hard work, what's your biggest takeaway? And I said, it's actually not all about the data science. It's just, I think, practicing uh, with a more balanced perspective between what we call system one and system two thinking. So for those of you who are not familiar with Don Daniel Kahneman's Nobel winning work on system one and system two thinking, system one thinking is you're performing based on your past experiences, so it's very 
This world is very reactive, it's automated. System two thinking is more, much more analytical. And I think as a seasoned clinician, I'm much more in the system one thinking category, but I think now I pump on the brakes when I can and make a decision after uh, some analysis. So I think uh, perhaps that's the future of medical education is to have a more balanced perspective. So in essence, we like to see uh, evidence-based me uh, evidence medicine evolve into what I call intelligence-based medicine, which is based on data science and everyone's data. So I think we're really not taking advantage of perhaps 90% of data that's buried in electronic records and not yet, um, and we're just kind of relying on published reports for evidence-based medicine, which I think is not going to be sufficient for the future of medicine. So for those of you who are used to your comfort zone, um, this is a sunset in Laguna Beach, where I'm from, and we're very uh, comfortable looking at it, but think about what it's like to look at another universe or another world of data science and artificial intelligence. This is the moonrise over the same beach in Laguna Beach. So um, it's much less predictable in terms of timing, but it's, I think, in many ways, um, just as beautiful as sunsets are. So give um, data science and artificial intelligence a chance in terms of learning about it and also um, becoming a member of the clinical community that, uh, who's considered an expert in this area. So one of the, I think, best uh, lessons in artificial intelligence is that it's really combined effort between the machine intelligence and the human cognition or the way humans think. So this is a uh, panoramic view of a meeting that I was proud to be part of. Um, it's the first time that we had a clinical datathon in which 100 clinicians and 100 data scientists are working side by side to solve research-like questions off of a public data set. And this was held in Beijing a year and a half ago. And um, so in other words, you're doing clinical research not by conventional means, but by using a publicly available database and querying it with the help of data science and then presenting abstracts thereafter. So it's a totally different way of, I think, doing clinical research. So I hope um, soon that um, 30 years ago when I did my fellowship in Philadelphia, um, you may laugh about it, but we used to take charts, all the fellows would take 10 charts a day and have to review the charts for the relevant information and manually inputting all that data into an Excel, Excel spreadsheet and then get statistics off of that. So I know a few of you may still be doing research that way, but hopefully in the near future we'll be doing it with data science and rather than um, doing it manually, which is very, very tedious as you know. So um, put the Cooper logo on there. Um, <laughs> so um, as someone asked me what SQ is, that's status quo. So status quo is very comfortable, but um, I think the AI boat is leaving soon. So please be part of that. At least know about it. And uh, you may not understand it, but at least know about the limitations as well as the opportunities that AI is going to bring you. So major takeaways, I intentionally keep this talk a little bit short so that um, I love getting questions, especially from audiences like this that's so heterogeneous. So AI is not about robots, but more about a portfolio of AI instruments. Think about the orchestra that may be rehearsing right now, but hopefully soon we'll be playing um, beautiful symphonies. Um, it's for sure sometimes hyped, but I think the um, the dividends, midterm and long term, will be, uh, I think, more than we expect. And it should be a key part of the future of medicine. I was glad to be um, presenting in front of the Council of Deans earlier this year, where I met Annette. And um, I think lastly, let's remember that it's uh, machine plus human, not machine versus human. Because right now the publication's about machines versus groups of human subspecialists, where I think in the future we'll be seeing a combined effort and a partnership between machine and humans to solve the problems we have in healthcare. Again, not only in clinical medicine in terms of 
um, medical images and decision support, but also solving the problems that we have uh, in healthcare in terms of administrative burden. And um, I think some important resources for you if you're interested in reading more. These are the three best books in the past three years, in my opinion. Um, in 2017, I think the best book was Machine Platform Crowd, written by an MIT um, uh, team. Last year, I think Prediction Machines, um, on the way to here, it's still, um, you can still buy this easily at the airport bookstores. Um, that's by a, a wonderful uh, trio of experts on AI out of Canada. And I think the best book this year is Digital Transformation. And it gets a little bit technical, but it's pretty much, uh, I think, a necessary read for any leader in healthcare to understand not just artificial intelligence, but all the emerging technologies as well. So it's a little bit of a textbook, but it's not a very, very long textbook. So I want to thank my donor, who is the granddaughter of Walt Disney, who believed in the vision of deploying artificial intelligence in healthcare and medicine. And my very patient um, professors and friends now uh, from Stanford. And additional resources, I've put, spent a lot of time putting together a very robust website. That's a URL. And on that website is an um, electronic book that you can download for free. And that's evolved into a real textbook um, that will be out in January of next year by Elsevier. And also on that website, there are a lot of talks from previous years of the meetings called Artificial Intelligence in Medicine, or AI Med. Um, and you, those are also all free to download as well. And that's my contact information, if you ever need it, including my cell phone number and my team. And um, for those of you who are interested in going to the next level, uh, we have a big annual, we have meetings all over the world, as well as cross subspecialties. But our big annual meeting um, is happening uh, in December, usually in California. And this year's meeting is December 11th to the 14th. And we have usually more than 500 uh, people of a mixed um, group. So clinicians are about 30, 40% of the group. And then the other um, constituents are data scientists, uh, researchers, um, inf informatics subspecialists, as well as investors come to this meeting. And you're, um, we particularly uh, like the younger generation to be well represented. So we usually, uh, for those of you who are students and our younger faculty, we have an abstract competition. We usually provide a scholarship to the meeting if you have an accepted abstract. And we typically get about 100 to 200 abstracts every year. And if you're interested in coming, that's the discount code, my um, favorite secret agent. So um, love to see some of you there. And that's also where you can get connected um, during this meeting, we have, as I said, an abstract presentation period, and we also have our annual meeting for the clinician group who are especially passionate about data science and artificial intelligence, and we have our uh, meeting there as well. So thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you so much, Dr. Chang, for that very enlightening talk. Um, we have time for questions, so I'm going to open it up. Um, can we start? Um, can start okay, down front. Thank you. Um, so, undoubtedly, this is where we're heading. I mean, clearly, there's too much data um, for us as clinicians to, to manage patients. Um, you know, when I train, I rely on my attendings for, for information and for insight. Now, each medical student that teaching has more information in their pocket yeah. than I can yeah. mass. However, we've been here before where we have this, this new technology that has, you know, what sounds like you know, endless promise and it's going to revolutionize the world. I'm, I'm an OBGYN, so yes. I was many years ago it was Peter Hopkins monitoring. Right. Um, and then it was the electronic medical record, and then it was the electronic, um, you know, the, the um, Mac 
for, for meditation and um, reconciliation. So how do we got, how do we use those lessons of the past and temper our expectations of this new technology? Yeah. What, what lessons do you see there for us? Yeah, I think the lesson we learned, as you correctly pointed out, from previous promising technologies in medicine, it's under-delivered. Um, but if you look at some of these technologies longer term, some of them have delivered even more than we expected. I mean, if you ever go back, I gave a talk recently about what the next 25 years in medicine is going to be like, and I researched you know, some of the um, video clips of commercials from 25 years ago, and it's pretty amazing. Um, Microsoft had a commercial, you may or may not remember, but it was about imagining the future where you can drive across the country without paper maps. Um, I mean, it was 25 years ago, we were actually had, I remember, had stacks of paper maps if I want to go far across the country. So I think, I think we just have to be patient and not over-invest in the early stage and see startups fail because the inflated expectations were not met. And I think, the mid, as I said, the mid and long-term dividends are going to be real and sizable, and maybe we're underestimating those dividends now. So we have to be, I think, very patient as a profession to not hype the um, early successes, but instead learn from failures early on and be patient with the technology that I think is very real and then learn to deploy in the future. So the good news is that I think the data scientists and the AI experts have pretty much um, explored the early successes and they kind of need the clinicians to be really involved this time as a partner to move forward. And I think we can guide the level of success as well as the um, expectations. I think a little bit more um, focus on the patients rather than just medical images where decisions are made. So I think the short version of, of uh, the answer is let's not um, over expect you know, the dividends early, but be patient with the technology and see the mid and long term successes that I think will come as we explore the technology. But your um, history lessons well taken that this has come before, but I think the convergence of the elements I've talked about has not ha ever happened in this domain to make it much more real this time and much more substantive. Yes? Yeah, I think um, that was a very robust discussion at the dean's meeting, as in that knows. Um, I think, you know, uh, I look back on my own medical education and reflect on what was actually really good to know and what wasn't necessary. And I think we have to have a real good um, reflection about how we're going to educate the next generation given um, the emerging technologies. And I think that a portion of the curriculum will have to depend on the, on the deans of these schools, um, devote a part of the curriculum on the emerging technologies that will take them into the future and prepare them much better for the future, to be honest. So I think, I think basic data science should be, um, just like statistics was when I was in school, should be a, a more uh, important part of the curriculum just because I think it's something that they're gonna be using um, much more frequently, at least the understanding is much more relevant. Um, one of the speakers that I've talked to recently said, and I, he was quoting uh, someone before him, that clinicians think medicine is a clinical medicine supported by data. In fact, it's a data science that has biological um, uh, features. So I think is just a way of looking at medicine very differently. With the preponderance of data and information now, it is um, not just sort of a, a clinical science, but it's also data science as well. I'm not ready to say that we should just rely on data science and forget about the clinical stuff. I always say it's a combination of both. Take the best of both worlds. So I think the future we need to prepare our students with a basic uh, understanding of data science 
um, what the basic premises of programming is because I think that actually helped me as a clinician as well to see the logic behind programming and think a little bit differently when I see uh, patients in a clinic that this is, there's some of the, the thinking can be structured rather than totally sort of unstructured. So I think it's a balance between the cog human cognition as a clinician and data science from machines. Um, so I think a basic understanding of uh, data science I think will be more and more um, uh, a requisite in medical education. Now, uh, when I was at the dean's uh, meeting, um, I found out that there's a medical school um, in Illinois that actually mandates every MD candidate to have a, a master's in either data science or computer engineering. So um, that's way out there in the ex other end of the spectrum. But I think, uh, and the immediate concern was, are we going to be picking the right candidates to be uh, physicians? And I think that dean promptly said that um, they actually incorporated humanities into the curriculum to uh, make sure everyone has a balanced perspective. So I think, um, again, the short answer is I think, uh, I feel very strongly that it should be part of the future curriculum and hopefully uh, we will encourage a growing cohort of clinicians with this background so it essentially becomes a sub-area focus in every subspecialty that I see in the future. And that's the part of the group, that's the group I'm trying to um, help to grow because I think right now if you look around the world, clinicians with a modern era data science background, you can um, probably say it's well less than a couple of hundred. Um, and hopefully that number will be in the thousands in the next few years. There's a question in the back, yeah. Right. And I keep thinking and saying that the city residents, well, maybe you need an assistant who is a data manager who can look up all the data. Is there, um, are there places that have AI that sorts out and gathers all that data that we have in our system to tell us what's applicable currently with the same patient in front of us? Yes. Okay. Um, um, yes. Um, I think, uh, well, we, at our hospital, we actually have a data science team that will actually um, curate and, and deal with the data. So one of the things I learned early in my education at Stanford was, and they have a pretty good patient database, was I spent 90 plus percent of my time sorting out the data and then only 10 percent of the time doing the really exciting AI stuff. So I think your point's well taken that healthcare data is so disorganized and so incomplete and oftentimes inaccurate that a lot of the time and energy has to spend just curating the data to make it acceptable to do the data science work. So um, up to now, there are very few um, sort of services or, or products that are available to do the data, what I call the data munging part. And I think I'm seeing more and more now because I think even the data scientists out there are realizing that a lot of the work has to be done up front with the data, just getting it sorted out, organized, structured, better, completed with accuracy. So um, there are just a few services that are available just to clean up the data, um, but not enough because of the, everyone's focused on the AI dividend and not enough people are focusing on the data part. And I said on the pyramid uh, slide that the foundation has to be really uh, sound and complete for AI to really yield the best dividend. So I think um, there are people who are starting to look at the, the data curation part of all of this um, more than ever before. So hopefully um, more and more availability will be there to um, do the um, AI projects in the near future. I think in the next few years, you'll see more and more software and services that are gonna be available to do the data curation part that you talked about. Uh, let's take one back there. What, what's your take on like a, a singularity event? Where do you see that playing into all of this in the face of healthcare? I don't see it. Um, I don't think there's going to be a defining moment for us to say, um, okay, AI is here now. You know, 
I think it's going to be um, very slow and pervasive and very subtle. And then we'll realize 10 or 20 years from now, how do we practice medicine back in 2019 without much of this? You know, it's not going to be like one defining moment as some experts are saying that you're just going to know that machines are all combined or smarter than humans now, right? I think that's the singularity event. I think it's going to come very slowly. I think it, we're just going to realize that we're going to be, we're going to find it more and more helpful as the years go by and hopefully not entirely dependent on it. There's an issue with um, relying too much on machines called automation bias, where humans are becoming more and more passive in the decision making, but hopefully we'll build tools into preventing that as well. So again, whatever we program and think about, we can actually uh, pass on to the machines. So that's gonna be very, very important that we have a balanced perspective. But I don't see a single defining moment where we realize that you know, AI nirvana is here I think it's just going to be very sl relatively slow, but it's going to be um, it's going to be here uh, in terms of how we practice medicine with it. Um, what? How do you see um, from a sort of a payroll, like insurance companies and you know governmental agencies, being able to? Buy into, or have they bought into this idea of incorporating AI into healthcare? And yeah. Are they willing to pay for it and you know, support it? So the question is about payers' involvement. They're, they're already all over this because they want the first user advantage to dictate policy and how they um, make decisions. So um, the good news is that they're not too far ahead. So I think um, I'm a spokesperson also, uh, the privilege of working with the AMA as a spokesperson for clinicians to get more involved now before we lose some autonomy over all of this, because we really deserve to be, I think, one of the stakeholders, early stakeholders in this entire game of elevating medicine to where it could be. So I think it's very important. Again, um, this is a clarion call for especially the clinicians that have an interest in this area already to really get involved um, and one of the questions I get asked often is, how do I get started? Well, take an online course, go to meetings that um, involve this and, and have a voice. Um, because the AMA and I both feel that the clinicians still don't have enough of a voice in the evolution of um, deploying artificial intelligence in clinical medicine. Yes? Right. I was wondering what the plans are for validation and also oversight, regulatory uh, oversight over in implementing AI in some form, like is the FDA going to have the oversight? Because, I mean, as we all see, this is beyond what the human brain can do. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Um, well, again, um, working indirectly with the FDA through the AMA, I think our posture is going to be that we're excited about the new technology. We're not ready to trust it as a profession. We need more validation. And um, I think uh, if you look, you remember the graph I showed with the trajectory and then the uh, exponential curve, uh, I think we're going to have to have the same um, strategy with regulatory issues. The FDA, the present reg FDA regulatory strategies are not going to work for this new technology because it's really designed for device deployment, not for software development. So I'm seeing um, encouraging signs that the FDA is very, very interested in changing its strategy to regulate this new technology very differently than it has in the past in terms of regulating devices. So I think it's very, very positive. Um, I think we have to 
Um, give it a chance and trust it when we can uh, and not um, become over-relying on it too early and realize that we are making mistakes in terms of inherent biases or mistakes that it can make. But on the other hand, I think sometimes we're asymmetric in our expectations. So look at AI as we look at our children. We expect them sometimes to be more perfect than we were. Um, and right now I hear criticism sometimes of clinicians when they look at a study that shows 96% accuracy instead of 99% accuracy. How many diagnostic tests do you know of where clinicians have 96% accuracy? <laughs> um, so we have to be a little bit fair to the machines as well. But I think it's the issue of, I think part of the problem is we look at, some of us look at AI as a black box and it's not understood. Um, and then the machines can easily say, well, you humans have a pink bag that makes decisions and we don't understand it either. So I think both sides have to um, have some reconciliation about trust. And I think clinicians are, are um, well, more, more willing to trust than sometimes perhaps my AI friends give us credit for. I think we, it's not a, a matter of explainability. It's a matter of interpretability. I think, um, I'll give you a concrete example. I'm a cardiologist. I have lots of patients with pacemakers. I don't understand every nuance of a pacemaker uh, in terms of the engineering aspects, but I trust it because I can program it, it works, and it does what it does. I think that's interpretability. So I think we just need AI to be interpretable where we can trust it, we know why it shows what it's showing, um, and perhaps be willing to trust it after that. But you're absolutely right, there has to be a lot more clinician oversight into the AI deployment in the clinical sciences than what I'm seeing now, and I think it will be. As I said, it's a growing cohort of clinicians actually with this background and be able to speak this language and understand what's, what's in the black box. So I think that problem will solve itself in the next five to 10 years easily. One more, okay. I'm sorry, I, could, um, I couldn't hear about half the question because of all the... So the trajectory of artificial yeah. the With the rise in the capability of computers mm -hmm. that um, you see at one point, what happens? surpass what we have now, the physical tools? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I think it will probably design its own tools, to be honest. Is that what you mean? Are you a surgeon? Are you a surgeon? No. Okay. Um, a surgeon wannabe? Okay. Um, I think in the future, um, if you're concerned that the relative, if you think about some of the tools we have in the operating room or in the cath lab for, for that matter, they are relatively primitive if you ever think about them. Um, so I think your point's well taken. At some point, we're gonna see, and this might be a really great area for research in the future, is to, how do you um, use artificial intelligence to design much better tools that we use in medicine and surgery? And I haven't heard much about that because right now the, the focus is on having um, sort of robotics, involved in surgery, but I think, I think you raise a really good um, area, which is just designing new tools to begin with, so that it's, much more, um, it's a much more better fit for anatomy as well as the procedure itself. So I think we're gonna probably see that in the next few years, and maybe you could help um, foster that area, because I think that's a fascinating area, just to have machines help design the tools rather than using the tools that we have up to this point. Um, the exciting area that involves AI in surgery is um, nanotechnology. So those of you who are surgery focused, um, we'll probably see in our lifetime 
uh, nano robots performing surgery rather than, um, if you think about your opening up a body cavity is pretty primitive. Um, in the future, you'll be doing straightforward surgery without actually having a large incision in a body cavity. So I, I'm excited to see research in that area as well. So, One last uh, question? Okay. I, I suspect we're going to be doing C-sections that way, so I have job security. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody.